Hello, it's Dr. Peg here at Freedom Mountain at Elisha's home, and it's good to be back with you yet again uh, this week. We have been studying uh, the great intercessors in the Word. Last week, if you recall, we started studying uh, Abraham, and uh, we looked specifically at his prayer as he prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, and we saw that he prayed a very specific prayer, uh, starting with 50 and then all the way down to 10 and as we can see he needed to keep on going that there wasn't even 10 and so I just want to encourage you that uh, if you've missed some of the uh, prayer intercessors uh, you want to go back and uh, study each one of those that you've missed uh, there's a lot of things in each of their prayers that we can take and apply to our own prayer life and become a more powerful prayer intercessor. Today we're going to be talking about Hosea and uh, his wife Gomer. And uh, this is an interesting one. I'm going to um, just give you a little heads up. This particular story might be one that if you have a small child, you want to make sure they're in a different room. Um, just as a precaution, as a polite warning to you, um, if you know anything about this story, there are some little um, indiscretionate details that may or may not come up uh, as we study. And so I just, as you're a, a mama or a daddy there and you've got small children, uh, this might be a study that you want to study in another room or maybe even study the recording at a later time when you're by yourself. So let's open with a word of prayer and then we're going to jump right into Hosea uh, chapter 2. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and gather around your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for um, just your uh, encouragement in helping us to grow past uh, what we often sometimes think are our limitations. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as you guide us into the word deeper, that you give us rhema word uh, and a fresh revelation. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've given each of us spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that uh, we would each be uh, attuned to our spiritual man uh, as we study today. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, and uh, we ask that you'd have full reign in our study. And uh, Heavenly Father, we give you all honor and all glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So as you were turning to Hosea chapter 2, I'm just going to jump right in and begin to give you a little bit of background in case you've not studied this book. This book has, um, it's one of the smaller books. Uh, it's a good book. It uh, is amazing some of the things that are in this book. Uh, very applicable to uh, present day, uh, as most of the word is. However, um, this very applicable for the period of time that we're in, uh, in this particular season. So Hosea, uh, he was a preacher, prophet, and uh, he lived in a time when religious folks didn't want to hear any of the message that he had. They were more interested in worshiping their idols. And uh, as the uh, hymnist says, uh, these people were prone to wander, prone to uh, leave the worship of Jehovah. And uh, they were wandering, 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 wandering. So at this point, God lets Hosea know that his bachelor days are up and that... Uh, He's going to make a wedding announcement. However, this wedding announcement comes with a prophetic word, and it's a dreadful prophetic word. And the word, um, the word is that his wife is going to break his heart, that her prom promiscuity uh, will prevail even during the marriage. And Hosea is humbled. And recognizes in spite of this that he needs to be obedient to the Lord. 
So can you imagine, you know, we, we talk about walking around circumstances and looking um, at situations as we pray for people and trying to get perspective as to the details and how they feel and what might be going on in their spirits. Uh, just stop and think about this for a moment. So, you know, it's one thing to uh, pursue a lover and to uh, say your marriage vows and then find out that, you know, this person is an unfaithful person, but it's a whole nother ball game to go to the altar to say your wedding vows knowing ahead of time that this person is not going to be faithful. Can you only imagine? So they take their vows, they're married, and so as he takes his vows, of course we know that this is going to lead him into a season of emptiness. He's going to feel abandoned, rejected, He's going to go through all of those things. Uh, so at some point shortly after they're married, he begins to hear rumors and the prophetic word has come to fruition and uh, he hears and he knows that she's going off with other men and as he looks at each one of his children that are being born, he's not even sure that those children are his children and remember we're talking Bible time so you couldn't go get a DNA test. Um, couldn't do that so you know he has to make a decision he's going to be a faithful husband regardless so then he also is going to be a faithful daddy regardless and so you know he's not only a heartbroke uh, husband but he is a broken-hearted father and can you imagine as a preacher and as a prophet he's got to be bewildered as to why this would be something that would be prophetically in the cards for him. And so she keeps wandering and wandering and wandering. And one day she wanders off into the wrong company. And so, um, you know, at this point, God tells Hosea to go do the unthinkable to redeem his wife um, because Gomer was being sold as a, Slave, and you know think about the things that he could have said to God think about the things I'm not going to sit here and tell you what I think he said because I want you to start to think per with perspective what do you think he said what would you say if that were you what would you say you know don't just take my words as to what I would say because of what my emotional uh, package would say but what would you say what would be your response to God? How would you, would you be that faithful spouse to go after the unfaithful spouse? Now, I want you to stop and think about this. This is an example of God who is the faithful lover of Israel who is the wanderer just like the wife Gomar. And does God go after, does he go after Israel? Yeah, he goes after Israel. He goes after Israel, and we're going to see that today. And so stop and think about this. Um, you know, there's been times, I'm sure, that we've been enslaved because we've been at the wrong place or been involved with the wrong situation. And so we are stuck in our chains and yet as we sit in our chains of insecurity discontentment fear what did he do he comes in he redeems us he frees us and he bestows his unconditional love and the act of redemption so as the story goes with Hosea he buys his wife back so then he redeems her with 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley. And we see this in the third chapter, second verse of Hosea. And so remember, when God redeemed us, he paid the ultimate price with the blood of his son, 
which we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Now, did Gomer deserve to be redeemed? Definitely not. Definitely not. Her behavior did not warrant such mercy. Did Israel deserve God's faithful betrothal? Their unfaithfulness did not merit his mercy. We don't deserve salvation, nor do we deserve his mercy. And so then you ask, why did God redeem us? It's not because we deserve it, but his mercy demands it. So this is a love story about Homer and Gomer, and yet it's also a love story about God and Israel and how they were that wandering bride. And it's about us. It's about us and how we wander off. And as we're wandering, he comes after us. And today we're going to actually see where he loves us so much that he puts a hedge of thorns about us and you're asking why would he do that we're going to learn about that today so let's continue so let's keep this in mind as we move forward if we're enslaved god will buy us back if we're lost he'll find us if we're ashamed he'll cover us with his love if we wander off he'll bring us home if we give up on him he won't give up on us. And no matter where we are, he sees who we are and he loves us regardless, unconditionally, unconditionally. So as we wander, 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 what is his response? His response is, come home. My love will set you free. And so when you're tired and starving and wandering, you need to come home. Come home. His arms are outreached. Come home. Come home. Return. Return to the arms that love you. Let's take a look now at chapter 2. We're going to look at Israel's sin. So we got a full picture of what we're dealing with here. So this portion of the scripture, chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, are the charges that are being brought against Israel. So this is what he says. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges. For she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlot trees from her sight and her idolatries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Now, let's look at this closely. Verse 2, For she is not my wife. So God is painting the picture of Israel, who is the adulterous wife. Now, no longer worthy to be described or compared to be a wife. And so we can see here that the relationship is dramatically broken. Israel has lewdly offered herself to other gods. Uh, notice here the phrase, her adulteries from between her breast. So this implies that she lays bare her bosom to entice her lovers. And he reminds that if she, had, if she didn't change, she'd be stripped naked. Lest I strip her naked and expose her and make her like a wilderness. So he's giving out a warning, a warning in regards to if she doesn't put away her harlot-like ways, she will be judged. So the relationship is broken. However, at this point, warning is coming out. The judgment is coming. But the blessings continue. But the warning has come. 
if Israel doesn't turn about, doesn't turn about, the blessings will be taken away. The blessings will be taken away. Look at verse 4 to 5. We see that Israel, now imagine this, Israel tries to justify her harlotry. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry, for their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. So, I will not have mercy on her children. So Israel is represented as the unfaithful wife and then her children represent the individual people of Israel and there's a warning if they do not come back to the Lord they will personally experience his judgment then I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread my water my wool and my linen so she's justifying her harlotry because she believes that she's getting all of her needs met from these quote lovers and she looks at all of the good that she thinks she's getting from her sin and to her it seems like a good deal so she's only thinking of the now moment she's not thinking of the future she's thinking of the now moment uh, self-gratification so Israel didn't seem to understand the passing pleasures of sin and we can see that in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 25 taking a look now in Hosea chapter 2 verse 6 to 8 God's judgment this is how God's gonna draw Israel back therefore behold I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths she will chase her lovers but not overtake them yes she will seek them but not find them then she will say I will go and return to my first husband for then it was better for me than now for she did not know that I gave her grain new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepared for Baal so all along the blessing has been coming from her first husband even though she's been unfaithful just as Israel had been unfaithful but God gives a warning one day one day one day so in order to bring Israel to repentance God promises to set a hedge of thorns on each side of her path so that it will hurt when she goes off the correct path and so the wrong paths will be difficult to find so, you know, usually when we think about God hedging us in with thorns, we think of it in a negative way. But in this way, God is giving that to us as a sweet expression of his love by hedging us in, walling us in so that we can't be our own greatest enemy. Then he says, I will go and return to my first husband. This is what she says. So the passing pleasures of sin for the moment are finished. So now she'll rebound back to her first husband where the grass is looking mighty fine about now compared to the grass she thought was greener when she was in her marriage. So she's going to return to her first husband just as Israel will return to the Lord. Note, for she did not know that I gave her grain, so even when Israel was going after other gods, God was still, the Lord was still providing for her. And this shows his unselfish love to Israel, even though what God gave, they took it, prepared it for worship to Baal. He still loved them, still loved them and gave expression of that. So we see that with Hosea. He provides for his wife. Uh, he spent it on her and her adulterous lovers. Uh, he went to uh, the lover's house where she lived uh, in adultery. Um, he provided for her. He could see that she was living in poverty and rags. And so he knocked on the door, spoke to the man who answered, 
says, Are you the man that's living with Gomer? And the man wondered what business it was of Hosea. Then he revealed, I'm Hosea, her husband. I brought these groceries and money so she can be provided for. And when Hosea left, Gomer and her lover must have thought that he was a fool, that he lost his mind. So, think about it. The food that he brought, they sat and ate and had a lavish dinner, I'm sure, as they continued to worship their idols. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. So this is an example. This is something that I really want you to think about. All right. This was something that one of the commentaries brought to mention. And, and I think it's a perfect, perfect example. So, God gives to us the trees of the forest and the iron of the ground. He gives us the brains to make an axe and nails from iron. And he gives us the energy to cut down the tree. And he gives us the skill to fashion the wood into beams. God gives us the cleverness to make a handle from the wood and a head from the iron and to combine it into an effective handle hammer then man then we take the beams the nails and the hammer and we nail God to the cross where God seemingly stretched out his arms died on the cross to take our guilt and our penalty to make a new and a restored relationship between him and between us amazing amazing then in verse 9 to 13 we see that God lays out how he will punish Israel verse 9 therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she has said, These are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest, and the beast of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says the Lord. So the first thing that he says, I will return and take away my grain. So God gave grain to Israel and she sacrificed it to Baal. Now, God will take away that provision and so then Israel would feel the need and the deprivation and perhaps she then would return back to the Lord. Then the phrase, but me, she forgot. So Israel is enjoying great prosperity during the time of King Jeroboam II, but she used her prosperity for idolatry and the pursuit of ungodly pleasures. And now God was going to take away the prosperity. In the next portion of scripture in this chapter, starting with verse 14, we see that there is a restoration that comes to Israel, the abundance and the joy is restored. Reading in verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Accor as the door of hope. She shall sing there, as in the days of her youth as in the day when she came up for the land of Egypt. Let's take a look at the word allure. I will allure her. 
be comfort to her. So he's going to allure her back to himself. And so this is what Spurgeon points out about the word allure. Allure uh, is a word that it's a remarkable word. It teaches us that the allurement of love surpasses in power all other forces. All other forces. And so the Lord in mercy determines that in all truthfulness, he will outbid the devil and he will win us to himself by fascinations, enticements, and allurements, which shall be stronger than any force of resistance we may offer. This is a wonderfully precious word. I will allure her. Allure. Interesting, interesting word. More powerful than to draw back or to drag back or to force. This isn't something where he is making it so that she has to. She, the love is rekindled. The love is rekindled and she comes back willingly, willingly. So we see that the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Okay, Achor means trouble. The valley of trouble. We can see that Achan's sin is discussed and discovered and judged in Joshua chapter 7 verse 26. Um, and that there was a transformation, the valley of trouble into a door of hope. And you can study that out further in Joshua chapter 7 verse 26. So he speaks to um, how she's going to sing there as in the days of her youth. And so Israel, when Israel is restored, she's restored in joy. The, the passing pleasures of sin are forgotten and the true pleasures of God are completely restored. The relationship is restored starting in verse 16 to verse 20. Taking a look now at verse 16. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals and they shall be remembered by their name no more. And they, and in that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle, I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Now notice where he says, you will call me my husband this is with great anticipation he's looking forward to the day that the relationship will be genuinely restored with his people he wants to have an intimate loving relationship with his people and he's waiting for the marriage like love and the commitment to be completely restored and renewed as it once was notice he says and not longer, no longer will you call me my master. All right. So he's not satisfied with a fear-based, obedience-focused relationship. Let's talk about that for a moment. He's not satisfied with a fear-based, obedience-focused relationship. All right. So that's a model of marriage. A model of marriage. Now, I'm going to step on some toes. I'm not going to apologize. I'm going to step on some toes, so get ready. This is an example of what a marriage is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be fear-based. It's not supposed to be obedience-focused relationship. Right? 
where they thought of him as a master, right? He wants a relationship that's intimate, meaning that he is husband, husband. Now, husband, wife, betrothal, team. Not one out here and one back here following. It's a team. So when he speaks, you are walking like a dance. Take a moment. Let that sink in. His relationship with Israel in its restored, renewed state. There's a heart change. There's a heart change. And the hearts are connected. God's heart and their heart are intertwined. It's connected. It's one. It's one. So what God wants, they want. What God needs done, they need done. They see that. They walk. It's a dance. You know, you ever get up in the morning and uh, you have every intention for the day to go well. And for whatever reason, somebody's at the door first thing in the morning or the phone rings or something happens with the little ones and they miss their bus. And the whole day just starts to like feel like it's going off the axis. And before you know it, about halfway through the day, you sit down exhausted and try to figure out how you had such good intentions. But the day didn't go any, any direction in the way that you thought it was going to go. Because why? You didn't take time to give honor and glory to God first thing in the morning when you crawled out of your bed. You didn't take time to do that. You didn't take time to do that. You know, if he's the love of your life, is that not what you should be doing the first thing you crawl out of that bed? And I don't care what time you get out of bed. I don't care if you're an early riser where you get out of bed at 2.30 in the morning or you get out of bed at 9 o'clock in the morning. What's the first thing that's on your mind when you get out of that bed? Should be the last thing that's on your mind when you go to bed. Should be the first thing that's on your mind when you get up. And then it should be on your mind the entire day and on your heart and your spirit the entire day. It's a dance with God. And so, you know, it's one of those things where if you don't keep up, if you don't keep up, you're off. You're off. You're off the rhythm. And when you get off the rhythm and you don't get yourself back on right away, you are really off. And you will stay off for the rest of the day if you don't catch it and then jump back in. Right? So notice he says, I will take from her the names of the Baals. Alright? So in Hebrew, the name Baal comes from the word master and so the two words sound alike it was the Baals the idols of the nations which wanted this master slave relationship with man but it wasn't God who wanted that he wanted a love based commitment based relationship with his people Now, let me ask you, in your own marriage, is it love-based? Is it commitment-based? Is it relational? Is it relational? Or is it fear-based, obedience-focused relationship? Something to ponder. So he says, bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth. So ultimately, this blessing of this restored relationship is going to result in a transformed earth. It's going to be changed ecologically and it's going to be changed politically. So this is a blessing that's going to be fulfilled in the millennial earth. But 
we can come to know the transforming power of that restored relationship now. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. We can come to know that now. So he says, I will betroth you to me forever. So when that relationship is ultimately completely restored, it will never be broken again. And so the relationship will be on a solid foundation of righteousness, justice, loving kindness, and mercy. And it will result in a deeper and a deeper and a deeper relationship with the Lord. Now, verse, in 20, verse 21 to 23 we see that blessing is restored. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine and with oil. They shall answer Jezreel that I will sow her for myself in the earth. And I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. So this is a, a vibrant, real relationship with God where our hearts should be in the same rhythm and beat as God's. And when we ask God to do things, those are the things he already wants to do. So, you know, how many times you ask somebody to pray for a specific and they say, well, if it's God's will, well, shouldn't you know if it's God's will? If you know the scriptures, should you, in most cases, not know what God's will is? I say you should. I say you should if you know God and you walk in the rhythm of his footsteps and the rhythm of his heart. I say you should know. If you don't know, then I say you're not in the word as you should be. Just saying. Remember in John 15 verse 7, Jesus taught this principle. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, it's not because it's just your wish as a flesh pot. It's because you walk in rhythm with his heartbeat. And so what he wants, you want. If I abide, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is a scripture that if you've never studied it, you've never memorized it, this would be one that, hey, this would be a good one to hang on your wall. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And so this isn't the name it and claim it. You know, you hear people that don't understand. This is not name it and claim it. This is if the scripture says it and you're walking in the rhythm of God's heart, then if you abide in him, and his words abide in you, and then you ask what you desire, it's going to be done. Why? Because you know him and you abide in him. What you desire was already what he desired in his will. So you need to know the word. You need to know the word. So with that, we're going to close and just say to you that, you know, there were some things that were thrown out there today. Things that, you know, hopefully you had your notebook, that you wrote them down so that you could take those into your prayer closet and begin to ask God to take you a little deeper. You know, um, we don't uh, sit here and give you knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. We give you knowledge for the sake of when you go in your prayer closet, you ask God for a deeper understanding. And when you come out of that prayer closet and you have a deeper understanding, then you should be ready to walk in application and we should see great change in your life by the power of Christ and the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message of unconditional love. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, even though we stray at times, that you love us, that you put that 
hedge of thorns about to keep us from going too far and to uh, protect us and make it more difficult for us to find those paths of sin. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you allure us back and that as we come back, our relationship uh, with you uh, is in sync, it's in rhythm. So your will then is our desire and we live in accordance to that. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, for your word never comes back void. Never comes back void. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that your Holy Spirit has had a visitation with us. We ask, Heavenly Father, that as we go through this week, that your word would pierce our hearts and that we would be changed in the name of Jesus for the goodness of the kingdom of God. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Be blessed. Be blessed.